Welcome in TNCRadio.live. It's Thursday night and we are live with Highway Fever. Now here's your host, Charlie Claiborne. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> as some of you know, man, I've been a, a little down here from that injury last week at work. I'm going to be out of work for another four to six weeks and uh, I, things are going well, but I'm alive and well here in Biloxi and tonight's show, we're back live. Uh, thanks to my producer, Tom Kelly, for the the great job he's done keeping this show going and uh, moving it along. Uh, tonight, guys, we're going to talk about a subject that's pretty visible. It's a pretty heated topic. We're going to talk about brokers, but we're not going to talk about brokers in a way that you would expect. You're not going to hear me start getting into brokers and making accusations, and I'm, I'm just done with that fight. We have to find a way to fight back against the brokers, and I think tonight's guest, um, I'm going to introduce him here in just a second, I have Rick Barnett. He is the CEO of Lane Access. And after talking uh, with Rick and learning some of the information he's gathered about the platform they're trying to build and the things they're trying to do, he made me realize a thing I've always said and often said over and over. The owner operators in this industry yield a great deal of power. And we're going to explain to you how much power you really have tonight on this broadcast with Rick's idea and what Lane Access is trying to do. Um, second half of the show, we're going to be joined by the president of NADRA, Bob Murphy. Bob's going to join us with uh, Mr. John Neesmith, a successful owner-operator for over two, three decades. Um, we're going to have some discussions tonight that hopefully will innovate, uh, educate, and uh, open up the discussion. So I'm going to bring Mr. Barnett in here. Rick, how you doing this evening? Hey, Charlie, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Tom, thanks for allowing me to be on your show. Well, welcome to Highway Fever, man. So I'm going to give you the mic. I'm going to let you kind of talk to the my, my listeners the way you talked to me yesterday and explain to them how you arrived at this idea for lane access and what the reasons um, in your pitch are to shippers about why lane access is really the way to go. Yeah, so... Uh, one correction on the front end I'd like to do, if uh, out of respect, Charlie, is this is not an idea. The platform is fully functional. Um, and I started this about a decade ago. I was a partner in a trucking company. And um, from the experience from the trucking side aspects, started building, the first side of it was patents around the concept of building a shipper carrier platform. And so that patent is called Shipper Carrier Interaction Optimization Platform. And the first iteration was done in 2015. And, you know, a lot of smaller independent carriers had paper logs at that particular time. They didn't really have a smartphone. And so introducing some of the features and functionalities that's really in the marketplace today uh, allows this type of network to actually be able to be at the point where it's going to start scaling. And so... What is lane access? So lane access is a brokerless direct freight network that allows smaller independent carriers to contract direct with shipper manufacturers, the people that actually have the freight. And so the challenge with lane access is really just educating the industry behind, quite frankly, freight movements. And that is a shipper has freight that he needs to move and he's movement from point A to point B. And you have a carrier that will haul that freight. And so contractually, they negotiate directly together. We have, we don't mark up the freight. We have nothing to do with the freight freight rates. What our focus is is network visibility because there's a million trucks moving empty. And the reason they're moving empty is because capacity. Neither side have access to each other. And so through the process of building direct contracts or relationships with shippers, they'll have access to freight wherever they're at and where they're going. So 97% of this industry is smaller and independent. So we've done over the years a lot of different things to expose exactly the way transportation movements are done. And they're done through freight brokers, third-party logistics, large trucking companies doing purchase transportation. And the smaller independent guy is the guy that's taking on all the risk. And I've challenged senior level guys on multiple different, you know, from the brokerage side to the freight side to the trucking side. And ultimately, you know, the business is done through a managed service that technology today can allow the independents to build a network directly with shippers of who, quite frankly, who they're hauling their freight for today. 
and start to get network visibility of freight wherever they're at and wherever they're going. And that's our goal. So we talked a little bit yesterday. <clears throat> a lot of people say there are already are, there are already ways out there. Um, we talked about this, JB Hunt 360, right, um, and all the others. And you made it very clear that um, a couple of key points. I, I want you to explain to people um the process, how you, how you were breaking this down, where what's the difference between what lane access is trying to do and what's already available out there on the market? Well, you know, over the years, I've been approached multiple different times and thrown a lot of different numbers at me to change this model. And when a, a carrier, a smaller independent guy contracts directly with the shipper and they negotiate lane access charges 1% per site and that's it. So if he's negotiating with the shipper and it's a thousand dollars on a move, then we charge the shipper a thousand and ten dollars plus a, a, a five dollar real time load tracking fee data. We score the performance metrics. We have our own private blockchain. It's stored on an immutable ledger. So it can't be manipulated and changed. There is truck order not used built within the network. There is detention time built within the network. Upon the rate confirmation that goes to the carrier, we pull payment from the shipper. Just like if you order something online, you have to pay for it before they ship you the product. When you order that truck, you pay for it. The payment is secured. Uh, it's held in an escrow account. And then we have a mobile app that connects or we can ca- connect to the in-cab terminal of the ELD. The load's tracked in real time. You could have direct communication dry- directly with the driver, send in app messages. You capture the picture of seal confinement or whatever else, the refrigerated temperature, whatever else that the shipper wants. The point is all that historical transportation movement is stored on a blockchain in an immutable ledger. And then upon the rate, when the load's delivered, there's a 24 hour window within the network that either side could could dispute damage, whatever. 99.9% of the time, you know, does what it says it's gonna do, releases payment directly to the carrier and the load's done. And so behind these models of the direct network, we've implemented a lot of things that we use on a day-to-day basis that everybody's listening to this on this and, and the people that's engaged in this conversation experience in a direct model. And we've implemented implemented those into the supply chain transportation <laughs> network. And you said in some of the research you've done going along over the over the last ten years in building this this platform and, and having it available now is um, how many of the shippers don't realize that the, the the people they're contracting aren't actually the people that are hauling their freight. Well, we that's a great question. In 2016, uh, I had a, a friend of mine that was a senior level with with Walmart, and and I challenged him. Um, because this conversation came up in 2016. And so in that challenge, I said, okay, you got to go to four different distribution centers and write the, the DOT number, the power unit coming in and out of those tr- out of them locations. Well, in the four hours, you know, at one location, there was 345 different DOT numbers. Well, those are independent carriers hauling that freight. Well, he was shocked because they don't have that many carriers in a contract. And that was one location. And so that sprung the first release of purchase transportation. And that in 2016 was brought on with a lot of, you know, flack on our end from major trucking companies and everything else, blah, blah, blah. Well, we just released another one about a week or two weeks ago, the follow-up now seven years later on purchase transportation. And from the, from the data aspect, facts in their financial release of the reports, for an example, J.B. Hunt has doubled their amount of purchase transportation, $7 billion on purchase transportation. Well, if you read, and I have a video out there that you can watch, but if you read, I read exactly how they report it. And so purchase transportation is basically they subcontract it at the end of the day. So what's that mean? Well, what that means is that if a, if a shipper gives an annual contracted rate, to this trucking company and he, for whatever reason, doesn't have capacity, breakdown, whatever else. But if you lined up them, them major trucking companies and said, how many of those loads are going on independent carriers or not on your trucks? There's going to be a percentage of that on a day to day basis of, you know, which is probably 30 to 40% of the time. Well, what's that actually mean to the shipper? Well, this is the major point that I want to focus on this with the network. 
the independents hold this freight today. And if they don't get behind a network where they can go direct and they get to control their own destiny, this will never happen because these guys got control of it. Who owns the freight controls the industry. And so if you're looking at subcontracting, well, what's that actually mean in dollars? Well, if you get a shipper, let's take Procter and Gamble. It's got 4,000 loads a day coming in and out, you know, and they have to subcontract. They got 50 contracted carriers and they subcontract those 50 carriers because of the various different reasons, but they already built that in. They already know what it is because for 20 years in the internet, they've been building their database of independence and knowing where they're going. And so they're going to build, they're going to subcontract that every time. Well, what happens? Well, if it's $1,500 a load and they subcontract it out and they make 20%, well, how much is that? It's $300. Well, it's $300. Well, if you've got 5,000 loads a day and 20% of that is subcontracted, right? Okay. Well, what's 20% of, of 5,000? It's 1,000 loads a day at $300. It's $300,000 a day. Well, it's three hundred thousand dollars a day that they're paying in a brokerage fee. They're getting the quote unquote service. Well, who's inputting the data? It's EDI. It's a guy in Chicago saying the load got picked up or delivered. It's not on the actual truck. Some of it is in their GPS enabled, but when they go outside their network, which is the independent, which is ninety seven percent, this conversation is not about lane access. It's not about me. This is about math. Yeah. Listen, if, if 97% on. of this industry is smaller independent and the only way they make money is hauling freight, then we're talking, this conversation is about how do they contract and get their loads? That's what this conversation is about. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that after our first break. This is Highway Fever on TNC Radio. I'm your host, Charlie Claiborne. We're here with Rick Barnett from Lane Access, Bob Murphy and John Neesmith coming up in the second half of the show. Stay tuned, sit tight, and we'll be right back after this quick break. How to prepare for the long haul trucker lifestyle. Being a trucker is more than a job, it's a lifestyle. I know you've heard that before, but I assure you that it's completely true. For the latest in Houston traffic, weather, news, and information, don't miss the Evening Surge, weekdays from 4 to 6 p.m. on TNC Radio.live. Roadside safety tips for truck drivers. It's expected as a truck driver that you're going to have to pull your truck to the roadside at some point in your career. Tires blow out, accidents happen, and trucks break down. Here's some roadside safety tips for truck drivers to help you handle the situation. When you're on the side of the road, be sure to have safety equipment including flashers, cones, reflective triangles, and maybe even road flares to alert other drivers. Unless your truck is unsafe to be in, stay inside to avoid being out near the roadway. If you need to open your driver's side door, Check before to make sure nothing is coming up the road. Do not roll your windows down if your truck is in idle. Fumes could come in through the open windows. Make sure to keep plenty of supplies in your truck in case you're stuck for a while. Check out our blog with items for emergency trucking safety equipment to have on hand. You're listening to TNC Radio.live. Remember to tune in to the Truckers Network Show with Shelly Johnson. Weekdays at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Hi, I'm Shelly Johnson with TNC Radio.live. You know me for the Truckers Network Radio Show and Women Road Warriors that I co-host with Kathy DeCarl. We know that life as a driver is not easy. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Whether you're moving down the highway or taking a break, you can take a moment right now to tell God about your hopes, concerns, and gratitude. Do you want someone to pray with? No problem. Just call the TFC Global 24-Hour Prayer Line. It's 866-515-9406. That's 866-515-9406. Or if you're using the TNC Radio.Live app, just press the Prayer Line button to be connected to a prayer warrior who will confidentially pray with you and for you. Thank you, and God bless. All right, welcome. 
Welcome back in TNC Radio Live live on a Thursday night. This is Highway Fever. Now here's Charlie Claiborne. Hey, welcome back in, everybody. You're listening to Highway Fever here on TNC Radio Live. Uh, my special guest tonight is Rick Barnett from Lane Access. Rick, we were talking a little bit during the break, and, and you've kind of touched on this amazing platform that you built, and, and you guys have taken the time to build. Two questions. Number one, we've heard in the past from some of my guests and in social media platforms, brokers say shippers don't want to deal with the independent. I want you, I want you to, to tell me in your experience what you're learning about what shippers want. Well, let's peel that onion back. So let's say that a shipper has a load that he's given to a broker. So if he has a question on that load, he's got to call the broker. Broker's got to call the carrier. Carrier's got to call the driver and the driver doesn't answer. What happens? It loops happens again, right? And so the shipper, no matter what, is always going to deal with that carrier, that driver, because that's the person that has is on that load. And so in this process that we built, the shipper is always going to communicate directly with the driver. So he's going to contract with the company because in trucking, as you guys know, it's different than DoorDash, Uber, and all the rest of these because if you have a a driver's license, you can drive for 10 of them different. And when you have a CDL and, you know, in trucking, as a driver, you work for one trucking company. So from the front end side, the system monitors the contractual relationship. And so when a loader tender to the carrier and he assigns it to himself as an owner operator or if he's got 10 trucks, he signs as one of his driver, that shipper is dealing directly with that independent, that driver. He's communicating with him. He's getting data. You can set this as low level configurable. So if the shipper wants to know, I want to know five hours prior to load pickup where he is in relationship to his pickup, if he's on time or not, you can configure that and you have that visibility. You know when he arrived. You know when he starts loading. We capture this all in the mobile app and it's stored within the network. You know in transit when he gets there. You know when he delivers the load, how long it takes to loading and unloading. These data sets are important to trucking companies. Three years from now, an independent guy is going to look at a load, he's going to look at a rate, and he's going to go, okay, I need more to to bid on that load because you take six hours to load and I'm going to run out of hours in order to go to that delivery. That insight and the data doesn't exist in this network because the network's 97% independent. So the when somebody says shippers don't want to deal with independence, they're already dealing with independence because they're hauling the freight. That's the craziest statement out there they because they're know. already doing the work. The shippers right. just don't know the amount of it, the, the amount of uh, capacity that the brokers are purchasing and who the, who they're purchasing. They're purchasing the one the one truck small fleet type individuals that use brokerage firms, they're still independent small mom and pop trucking operations, only they can't prove their reliance because there currently isn't a way to track their dependability, their on time, uh, their on time commitment, their safety. Th- that's currently not being tracked when the shippers are using brokers. Hey, look, here's the thing. OK, this is all data driven. We're not guessing. And and and. It's one thing to pull a risk assessment from whether he has, you know, a crash or whether he has a ticket or whatever else. We're talking about performance. Is the guy going to pick up on time? Is he going to deliver it enough? Is his truck clean and things like that? 99% of the guys that's invested the money that's, that's went and bought a hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollar truck, whatever it is that he's buying, depending on the model and the year and all this other miles and everything else, you know, And then he buys a trailer and he buys insurance and he puts gas in it and he has to get an operator for it. That guy's the most vested guy in the game. And for a shipper to say, I don't want to deal with an independence. Well, here's a new flash. This is what I tell these, these larger shippers. You're already dealing with them. Matter of fact, I'll run a pilot for any shipper out there from any side and we'll just put the mobile app on every driver that comes in to their yard that picks up the load, put their DOT number on there, put their name on it. And in 90 days, I can tell them exactly how many loads are being subcontracted out and how much money it's costing them. Because that money that's it's in that, that transaction is billions of dollars. Quite frankly, it's about $250 billion to be exact. Okay, so let, let me get this straight. This you just said something that I, I, I want people to hear clearly. So, do you think 
the reason for a lot of the fight with the broker transparency. It's not because the brokers don't want us to know what they're doing to us, but the brokers don't want us to know or the shippers to know what they're doing to the shippers. That's it's both. I mean, look, the more chaotic that the industry is, the more you need them. The last person in line that's going to want to bring transportation to an efficient network is the three PLs, brokers and large trucking companies. Because every time there's a mess, it gives them an excuse to charge more, but not pay the carrier anymore. They control the middle. They control the information. And if an independent asks, okay, well, you're supposed to buy law, tell me the rate, this blackball. Well, why would they do that? Because they got 50,000 other independents that can haul the freight and they don't care because they're controlling the money. They're controlling the freight. And so, you know, I couldn't have this conversation, quite frankly, guys, three or four years ago. The technology was there, but I couldn't have this type of conversation because in this network capability, you need a device in that cab in order to build this network. When the independents find out, that's why we did that video about showing the power of the network. Because I need you guys to say, look, we're a team. We are a platform. We don't mark up the freight. And for years, I haven't charged the carriers anything. Why? Because I was building a model that they can get value out of. We're rolling out a subscription model premium next month. But for years, we haven't. And and so therefore, if you look at the VC money that's put money into bringing efficiency, all them models are making money off the independence back. All of them. You can name on, I can tell you exactly how it works. Uber. So they, they get a rate from the shipper, they give them a rate, and they subcontract it out to the independents. It's, just, it's an electronic broker. All of them are. So the That's same where they thing, look at their the revenue. Same, That's where they make their revenue. The same thing's still happening, though. The shipper's being overcharged because the broker's the, broker's the one making the money. So either they're making it off the back of the trucker, or they're making it off of their shipping contract. Think of it this way, okay? Let's just let's just say we have a magic wand and we wave it, and all of a sudden, two years from now, we've got five, six, seven hundred thousand owner operators in a network, and they have hundreds, if not thousands, of contracts directly from shippers, and they can start building forecasts into their network and saying, "I'm going to go to from Chicago to Atlanta, to Atlanta to Jacksonville, Jacksonville." back up to Atlanta, I'm going to go over to, and you can start building your forecast, negotiating and communicating directly with the shippers. And what happens? That shipper, instead of buying capacity with an annual contract, trying to forecast pricing, network visibility gives you leveling because you're going to make good rates wherever you're at and wherever you're going. And if you don't like the rate, you might adjust your way because you get a better rate from this directly from shippers. That's the future of the network. It's not forecasting, trying to figure out. If a guy comes out of L.A. today and he's an owner-operator and he's going to Chicago, when is he coming back to L.A.? Nobody knows. Well, if there is 97% of the industry where nobody knows and there's no communication, how are you going to build efficiency? Because that represents three-plus million drivers. So if they come together in a network, what happens? They get real discounts on fuel. I mean, point of sale. I'm talking 50, 60, 70 cents a gallon. Why? Because the network is bought, independent networks, but is the biggest purchaser of fuel. They're the biggest purchaser of insurance. They're the biggest purchaser of data. The network, the 97% is not getting any of these benefits by themselves. Period. All these guys that's doing all this factoring and brokers and purchase trans, they're the ones that's making all the money. None of these guys standing alone get any benefits of doing the work. It's a fact. The network is designed to build efficiency, but it's going to benefit the marketplace of the owner operators, the independent guys, the guys that's taken on the risk. I mean, ask yourself a question. With all the capital that's out there in these massive, massive companies, Walmart, Amazon, all the rest of these, why don't they have a million truck operation? They have a capital. Why don't they have a hundred thousand? That's just a question. I mean, why don't they have one? I mean, we made it a big deal because, you know, uh, Swift acquired blah, 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 and there are 25,000 trucks now. So what? 
They they can't move the millions of loads every day. They don't resent. They don't represent a quarter one percent of the industry daily freight. The independents move the freight. The and we're independents gonna, need a network. Yeah, we're going to speak with two of them right after our break. We're coming up on the the first break. Guys, we'll be right back after this short recess. Uh, you're listening to Highway Fever here on TNC Radio dot live. My special guest Rick Barnett from Lane Access coming up next. Bob Murphy, president of NADRA, and John Neesmith. We're going to have a conversation with with, with, uh, Mr. Barnett, and uh, hopefully we're all going to learn some. Be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Cortman, and now for the Mental Health Minute. Can people really change? I mean, should you even bother getting into therapy it's expensive and time consuming and and for what can you really change years ago i had a graduate school professor who said people don't change unless it's too painful not to is that true well in my experience not all the time but it's pretty good because change is often motivated by pain by some kind of discomfort, by something that that hurts deeply, something that frustrates us and therefore motivates us to take on a challenge to change something. So what can we change? Not other people. Oftentimes not circumstances, not the weather. What we can change is our perception of things. We can change our behavior, our responses to people and situations. And we can also learn how to let go of painful things from our past. Those are things that therapy can really help you change. Be sure to listen to Building Strong Minds with Dr. Chris, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, right here on TNCRadio.live. Hear the best of TNCRadio.live every night. It's TNC Radio Primetime. Interviews, music, information, and news you can use every night, 7 to 9 Eastern, 6 to 8 Central, TNC Radio Primetime. Ready for the power of positive and something that will put you back to a time you wanted to last forever? Music is the ultimate time machine. What was your favorite time? Do you want to go back there? LTD Radio features the songs of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that will transport you to a happier time. It'll make you smile and brighten your day. We could all use that about now. TNC Radio.Live is proud to carry the great music of LTD Radio. Welcome back in TNC Radio Live. This is Highway Fever. Here's Charlie. Hey guys, welcome back in. Uh, listen, this is Highway Fever. We are here on TNC Radio Live. Uh, I'm here every Thursday night, 6 p.m. Central. There are a lot of good shows, a lot of good conversation on this channel. Be sure to check out the app TNC Radio Live. Uh, give it a look. A great platform. Um, again, built for drivers. So my special guest, Rick Barnett, welcome back. I'm going to bring on, guys, Mr. Bob Murphy, the president of NADRA, and John Neesmith, and, uh, a couple decades of wisdom as an owner-operator, um, and a, a leased, has been leased on to a carrier. Uh, John, Bob, good evening. I'm going to let you guys uh, start off the conversation with Mr. Barnett, ask your questions, and uh, just have a back and forth here and see what we can learn. Thanks for having us, Charles. I, I do have a quick question, Mr. Barnett. Um, uh, as far as factoring, um, like you, you, you mentioned that, but I know a lot of these companies like Google, Pepsi, um, they're, they're uh, 20, 30, 90, 120 days out pay. How does that money get to the driver on this app if there are 120 days pay the way their business is set up? How would we go about getting paid yeah, great, great question. So, you know, in, in any model, right, it's a transformation. Ultimately, the power is in the network, which is the 97% of the guys hauling freight. And so in this model that's currently broke, 
these Pepsis and Chryslers and all these guys and, and are asking these guys to take on all the risks, pick up the load, deliver it in two or three days, and then get paid in 45, 60, 90 days, it don't work. Now, ultimately, what we provided in the front end side, when a shipper registers, right, they have to have liquidity within the network because the only way they can go to rack is upon the rate confirmation, that capital has to be secured and held in escrow. So we have a process and a relationship that when a shipper registers, they communicate directly with a liquidity provider. If they don't want to provide it themselves, they can get a line that will say to the network that, but at the end of the day, when that truck is ordered through the network, that payment is held in escrow. And just like any transformation that happened 25 years ago when the internet started, and I remember I was the, I'm the youngest of six, and I remember all my older siblings going, eh, people aren't going to put their credit card information in there. No, I got to go, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and what happens? Some people didn't use it for a long period of time, right? It's, Early adopters yeah. did. But there is literally tens of thousands of shippers. And so when the independents tell their shippers that, look, we want to go to RACT, and the more and more and more that happens, okay, when a shipper registers, there's there's too much economic benefit Okay, when you factor, when, when, when you pay in 30 or 45 or 60 days, right? It's a yep. numbers game. Okay, there's more economic benefit for that shipper to remove that purchase transportation and that 500 loads that's being subcontracted out at $300 on an average, which is $150,000 a day in cost that the independent's already doing the work and doing the performance. You're just not going direct. He's not making $150,000 a a day in interest by waiting 45, 60 days to pay his invoices. So he's going to learn very quickly. Yes, he's going to learn very quickly that there's more economic benefit to go directly with who's giving him the service today and who's hauling his loads than wait and and pay. Because some of those guys that won't transfer because they do that into the network, Mm -hmm. they're the guys that are going to be paying premium rates because what's going to happen to the network? It's the capacity is going to shrink. It's going to shrink because the independent guys are going to go to the, to the shippers that are, perform, are putting their loads to the network. And when that capacity constraints and, and all of a sudden now, then purchase transportation don't have the capacity to move that, that demand is going to force a change to the industry. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. I, that was the second part to my question. You answered it before I got to ask it. So that's the incentive for these companies like your G- G- Googles and Pepsi Cola to do that is actually it's saving them money. Right. So so by design, in our model, we don't charge the shipper anything to register. He can come in, he can set up his account, he can, he can build direct contractor relationships with carriers. The only time he's charged is if he accepts a tendered rate to a carrier. We pull payment, hold an escrow, and then we charge him 1% plus a $5 load tracking fee. So on a $2,000 load, he's charged $20 plus $5. He's charged 25 bucks. That's it. So there's the reason why we designed it that way and the reason why we don't have BC funding and we control our own destiny is because this model don't work in them worlds. So, So we've stayed lean to build this model that's effectively you know, going to position the industry to where they can go direct. There's no hurt. What You know, why wouldn't a shipper go direct with who's actually hauling their freight? And so the single issue in transportation, in my opinion, is summed up in one word, and that's capacity. Shippers go to load boards or they go to different because they need capacity. So if they build their network of independence, they will have on-demand capacity and depending on where the guy is, is the more direct contracts that the guy has, the more opportunity he's going to have access to freight wherever he's at. Okay, that makes sense. I, I, I mean, that sounds really great. Uh, I, I, I see the incentive because I was thinking it's great for the driver, but now I see why a uh, shipper would be interested in this. I was thinking, you know, when you were talking before, I'm like, this is great for the driver, but why would a company sign up for it? Money is a great motivator. So that, that answers my question. <laughs> Let me give you an example, Bob. Okay, I was six weeks ago at a, at a pretty large shipper, 65 plants. Okay, and I asked them, how many contracted carriers you guys? How many carriers you have on the contract? You know how many they said? 10. So what's that tell you? Okay, 
So not only are they buying a premium of capacity, okay, they're also not utilizing network visibility of qualified carriers going right by them plants that are going empty that they could utilize with a, a system like this. So there's a, it's not about, here's the thing with the independence. What kills a trucking company, and I know from experience, is going empty. And so when you have visibility of, of, and everything's tracked now with ELDs, you're landing on spots in a reset, forecast your next moves because you have, and start building unlimited amounts of, the network doesn't care if you have 50,000 direct contracts with shippers. Because here's where, where the industry is going, okay? When we build the network, we're going to level the industry. There's not going to be truckload less than truckload. Why? Because network visibility is going to allow you full capacity movements. Guy coming out of Chicago and he's 50%. What does the network know? We know all the attributes. We know how much weight he can take. We know what is because the load manifest is coming from the shipper is the exact bill of lading that's on that truck. We know all the attributes. So he can be alerted, the system through artificial intelligence, right, could yeah. alert the network and say, hey, there's a guy in Effingham that's got two pallets that you could swing by and pick up for $400, right? That guy saved money, and you made $400 on the back of that truck, which increases. So now when you're getting real rebates at, at the fuel, you're getting maximum movements of capacity, and you're actually carving out the broker you are making real money and controlling your own destiny as an owner operator because you're cutting cost on everything. It's not about putting cheap freight out there. That's not, we don't mark up the freight. We don't have nothing to do with the freight. We're a platform. That's the thing I try to tell the independents. Oh, you're putting cheaper. I'm like, look, we don't have nothing to do with it. This shipper owns the freight. You're negotiating with him. If you don't like the rate, get another shipper because right. eventually what's going to happen? That shipper is going to have to increase his rates because he's not going to have anybody hauling it. Exactly. Brokers, I, I newsflash. I don't know if anybody knows this, but brokers don't have trucks. They don't have freight either. That's right. That's right. Shippers have freight. Well, Independents have trucks. Bring them together. Hey, yeah. This is John Neesmith. Uh, I, I, could add, I could add to Bob's question just a little bit. Um, how would your platform handle fuel surcharge? Because these shippers are paying fuel surcharge. And how is that going to be built into the negotiations? Would that be the, the carrier directly who would be responsible yeah. for that negotiation? Or you're, is someone yeah, going to hold the hold the shipper's feet to the fire? Because the shipper will back out of anything they can get away with. They ain't gonna be able to do it in the network because here's why. So the so the answer to the question specifically is you do it on the front end, okay? Uh, when you're negotiating for this load to pick up from point A to point B, and you're like, hey, look, you're gonna crawl into here. I'm going into New York. I need a fuel surcharge, and I need a total. You're gonna negotiate that, and you're gonna confirm on that before you get a rate confirmation. So now it's in the network and it's on a mutable ledger. There's no there's no backing out of that. Okay. Well, well it, let me clarify my question a little bit because they're used to dealing with long-term contracts the way we do freight now. And on your platform, these will not be long-term contracts. These will be uh, uh, basically point of sale. So well, here's the they're not they're not going to be willing to negotiate a fuel surcharge on a one by one transaction. John if, if that guy needs to move his freight, and if the independent says, I'm not hauling your freight unless you go to this CDL term, permit test are they going to do it? For truck drivers. Yeah, they will, because they the need CDL the freight permit moved. test is one of the most Listen, this is a new model. In your okay, career. the days of buying capacity the test, in, in three to five, if we build this network, that's over and when we build this network, pounds. and you have the independents that are in there, the they have the control because they have the truck. The CDL and so covers in this, a lot of it's not being Studying unjust, it's being fair and transparent. CDL what your question really is, is we Luckily, need a system to force them to stand on the right to thing. The studying for the you need a fuel surcharge in order to haul that. What, well, what happens? Nobody does test. it because Just like there's no have a before obtaining a regular driver's The license. system is going well, to force it. Why? Because it can block them. It can get 
So, a CLP yes, allows you I to operate a commercial motor world, vehicle while under a, the supervision is, of a valid CDL holder. To get a CLP, you must that first have changed, pass the CLP right? test. This is a the CLP change. test is That's a 100 question written exam divided up into three sections being secured, general knowledge, we air brakes, to the and combination vehicles. And held in escrow before CDL that permit test is done. study tips. That was a the major, CDL permit major covers a lot of in information. our world. Typically, a state CDL uh, manual so is over 180 pages long. By if you want to pass, you'll need to allow yourself the plenty of time to study and prepare. Trying to cram process. all the study material so in a couple of days before the exam will not give you the best results. Because we suggest what happens studying a little bit each day when you're alert and able to retain to as much information as possible. Because surcharges are based on demand CDL in the market handbook. that is Each fluid, state has its own right? CDL handbook that I mean, has answers to questions that are found on the CDL permit test. It's important to have the most up-to-date version of the handbook. The fuel surcharge is based is based on fuel price alone right and but where does it, fuel price come from it has fuel price comes well, from from all the dynamics I, of of can't get right. the fuel in weather blah 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 that affects a but, weekly fuel price but the fuel surcharge model has worked great for a, several decades because you're able to negotiate a, con, a long-term contract based on your cost that you can predict to some degree and then the volatility of the free, of the uh, fuel market was was calculated into the fuel surcharge, and it protected the carrier and the shipper until the broker came along that, and claimed that they were asset based in order in order to get this. And they do claim that they're asset based, and they are asset based by technical definition. Yeah. And that brings that brings me to it. That brings me to another part of my question. I'm not I'm not against your uh, your platform at all. I, I completely understand it. I'm all for it. But it, the thought keeps coming back to my mind. Um, one of your competitors, much smaller, tried to build a platform, was doing great, ran up against a brick wall. And in a conversation with him, he conveyed to me that the brick wall that he did not anticipate in all this, he always thought it would be the carrier. He always thought his hurdle was going to be educating the carrier, the, the little owner operator, how to do this digital business that, that he went around to also saying, these shippers want to do business with you. There's just no platform to do it. And then when we got into it, the thing that slapped them in the face was the hurdle was the shipper. It was not the carrier. It was the shipper. When the shipper learned that a number of these carriers had signed up and wanted to do this, they no longer wanted to price their freight. They wanted the, they wanted the trucks to bid it into the dirt, and the, the thing kind of collapsed. But, but anyway, the, the second part of the question before we run out of time. Well, we're, we're, we're approaching – we're approaching that time where we're going to take a quick break, guys. So save your thought, John, and we'll come right back after this quick break here on TNC Radio Live. This is Highway Fever, and we'll be right back after this break. Study tips for truck drivers. The CDL permit test is one of the most important tests you'll take in your trucking career. Drivers must pass the test to practice driving a semi-truck, bus, or any other vehicle that's over 26,000 pounds. Like any test, you need to study and take the necessary steps to get prepared. The CDL permit test covers a lot of information. Studying the entire 180-page CDL manual can be overwhelming and exhausting. Luckily, we have some CDL permit test study tips to help make the studying for the exam much less stressful. What is the CDL permit test? Just like you have to have a permit before obtaining a regular driver's license, you need to get a commercial learner's permit, a CLP, before you can earn your CDL. A CLP allows you to operate a commercial motor vehicle while under the supervision of a valid CDL holder. To get a CLP, you must first pass the CLP test. The CLP test is a 100-question written exam divided up into three sections, general knowledge, air brakes, and combination vehicles. CDL Permit Test Study Tips The CDL permit covers a lot of information. Typically, a state CDL manual is over 180 pages long. If you want to pass, you'll need to allow yourself plenty of time to study and prepare. Trying to cram all the study material in a couple of days before the exam will not give you the best results. 
We suggest studying a little bit each day when you're alert and able to retain as much information as possible. Get your state's CDL handbook. Each state has its own CDL handbook that has answers to questions that are found on the CDL permit test. It's important to have the most up-to-date version of the handbook. Find out what to study. So you have your state's CDL handbook. Now it's time to study. The key to studying for the CDL permit test is to study smart, not hard. Finding out what is exactly on the exam is one way of studying smart. Take a practice test. Practice tests are a great way to show what you know and what you need to be studying. Also, taking a practice test can make you feel more familiar and confident, which will help you reduce anxiety on the day of the CDL permit test. In conclusion, studying for the CDL permit test may seem overwhelming at first, but establishing a good study routine will help you get prepared and reduce stress. Remember, know what's on the test, focus on topics you're weak on, take a practice test, and have fun. TNCRadio.live, your commercial driver navigation station. At Hot Shot Secret, we share the science behind common diesel problems and their solutions. For example, diesel particulate filter regeneration. The DPF catches particulates left over from combustion. The DPF regeneration cycle cleans the filter with temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The computer sensor triggers the DPF regen, which is often accompanied by a loss of power and fuel economy. The frequency of DPF regens are in correlation to the cleanliness of the fuel burn. Under heavy operation with the dirty burn, DPF regens can occur multiple times per day. Hot Shot Secret Diesel Extreme Fuel Additive promotes a more complete combustion, creating fewer emissions and therefore fewer DPF regens. Vehicles using Diesel Extreme experience 83% less DPF regens. Hot Shot Secret Diesel Extreme is available nationwide at truck stops, fine farm and auto stores, and online at hotshotsecret.com. Hot Shot Secret, powered by science. Welcome back in TNC Radio Live. This is Highway Fever. Here's Charlie. I, yeah, I, I got to apologize, man. We we ran a little bit longer than that, and the station forced the break on the producer. But I'm going to tell you, we're going to definitely have Mr. Barnett back because the conversation and the questions um, that were going on during that whole thing, uh, the producer did record it, so it will probably re-air tomorrow morning um, after he edits a few things. Uh, great conversation. I'm going to let John Neesmith ask his last question because we're about three minutes from having to close the show. So, John, we're definitely going to have Rick back, guys. Don't worry. He's got a lot more information to give us. John, go ahead and finish this up. Two minutes, you and Rick hash this question out. Okay, real quick, Rick. We're running out of time. There's a there's a blaring thing that I see that has not been covered in this conversation, and that is that power only is way bigger than what people realize. Uh, you, you may realize it, but a lot of pe- other people don't realize. These shippers have become really, really accustomed to the drop and hook situation, the, the larger ones and you know some of their customers. And a lot of guys with their own authority are doing power only for say, you know, like JB Hunt or, or Snyder or, or someone like that. And if these guys don't Oh, goodness. Yeah, so he faded out. Did you get the, enough Equipment of the questions? Oh, there we are. To haul the freight with, you know, how do you get around this? I'm sorry, John. I, a, a lot of your a lot of your question got got uh, oh, uh, garbled. Garbled. I'm sorry. I, I, I think I, your question because I can I can time. nail it down really 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 power, really quick. power only. How do you handle power, power only? only. How do you do power only? Because a lot of guys do not have trailers at this point. Well, power only is a segment just like our system is is agnostic. You can do flatbed, dry van, refrigerator, car hauler, whatever. Else. So there's a section on there's power only. So if you want to build a relationship with power only shippers, that's what you do. And and in that, UPS does that. that you know, um, Procter and Gamble does that. There's a lot of shippers that do power only. So you start building direct relationships and giving yourself visibility directly to those power only shippers. I mean, we're talking about guys, we're talking about millions of loads a day. 
Millions. Uh, again, I, I, I am mind blown about the, the amount of information you have, Rick, and you haven't even scratched on some of the stuff because we had a longer opportunity to talk. We're definitely going to have you back. Um, again, but, but, but what you're basically saying is these guys need to understand owner operators, independents need to understand the power they have as a collective. We're not we're not talking about an individual mentality. We're talking about as a collective because the brokers and the shippers are looking at them exactly that way. As a collective, they're taking advantage of and they're purchasing at the price they want to pay, not the price that the carriers negotiating. But we end up we end up hauling this freight for the price the shipper and the broker want to negotiate. So it's a collective. It's going to take time. The, the platform is there. It's up. It's ready. It has all the resources. You, you've discussed how the, how you're going to secure the payment. You know how they're going to have to put money in escrow. How the money is going to be available for the guy that hauled the load when he completes the load. I mean, it's a great platform. It's a huge platform, but it's going to take a lot of dedicated uh, work. The industry has to want this. And judging by the temperature out there and the complaints and the talking that's going on, they want this. So, guys, we will definitely have Rick back. Rick, thanks for joining us tonight. We are going to bring you back, I promise. And guys, you, next yep. when or next Thursday, six PM Central, we'll try to work nope, Mr. Nope, Barnett nope. back in nope, with the nope, guys nope. from not, 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 not next Thursday because we'll be at Matt's. Oh, okay. There's a surprise, but as soon as Matt's is over, we will be back yep. Thursday night. The week after Matt's. R- Rick, yeah. Rick, will you be at Matt's? No, I will not. All right. So six PM. After Matt's is over with, we're going to have the guys from Trucks Parking and Mr. Barnett back here on TNCRadio.live, the best trucking news and information network built for truckers. Uh, we will be back here on TNCRadio.live. This is Charlie Claver, the host of Highway Fever. We'll catch you next time. Rick, Bob, John, thank you very thank you, much Tom. for participating. Thank you, Bob, Thanks. Charlie. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, guys. Appreciate the conversation. Appreciate it. And for.